and welcome to another episode of the Knowledge Show powered by Northscape. I am Ahmad Zaman and I will be moderating today's session for you. For everyone who's tuned in for the first time to the Knowledge Show, this initiative by Knowledgecape is to bring leaders from different walks of life to talk about business, technology, people, talent, and life in general. The discussion in today's episode will be around the topic, workplace productivity. And without further ado, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce to you my guests for today, Darshini Sitaram and Ritvik Mishra. We'll start with Darshini. Darshini is the Global Head of Learning and Development at IUNO. She is currently leading the learning and development team and works along with Global HR, International Communications team, and the IT infrastructure team. Her role covers training and development programs in various initiatives for 2,500 employees from more than 30 offices around the world across three regions. Darshini is well experienced in handling mergers and transformation of teams and platforms from one to another. She also champions mental health at the workplace and enables a secure working environment by creating more awareness and programs related to it. Thank you so much, Darshini, for being a part of this show. Thank you, Homer. I'm glad to be here today with all of you and share some insights based on my experience. Thank you so much. Along with Darshini, we have with us Ritwik Mishra. Ritwik is the global head of consulting at Nonscape. In this role, he leads a multifaceted portfolio covering solution design and delivery, customer satisfaction, and enterprise eminence. He has over 20 years of experience in learning, leadership development, and organizational development spanning multiple sectors and geographies. He has been credited with driving large-scale system implementations, organizational cultural change, CXO development, and commercialization of shared services. He's a guest faculty at some of the top management institutes in India and has had the privilege of sharing his thoughts on learning across generations as a TEDx speaker. Thank you so much, Ritwik, for joining us. Thank you so much, Amar. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So Ritwik and Darshini, since this is the first time for both of you on this show, before we move to the more serious discussions, we have sort of a icebreaker session where we play a fun round, right? So it's a rapid fire questions round where you have to answer would you rather questions, right? So this helps our audience get to understand both of you better and for each of you also to get to know each other better. Right? So Darshini, we will start with you, right? First question for you goes like, would you rather eat your favorite food in every meal or stay in your favorite destination all your life? I will stay in my favorite destination all my life. <laughs> ah, that's nice. Which, which is your favorite destination? Though? I would like to be in, it's in Malaysia, Penang Island. It's my retirement island that I'm yeah. hoping for. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Oh, that was an easy one for you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next question for you, Dashini, is uh, would you rather live a life without the internet or without friends? Oh, I would love, I would rather live without internet. I cannot live without friends. We <laughs> have lived without internet. Yeah, I can live without internet, but not without friends. I will die without seeing people. <laughs> I'm giving my age away here, but when we grew up, there was no internet. So we have lived that phase. Right. Yeah. Real friends instead of just having thousands and thousands of Facebook friends, right? True. Third question for you. Uh, would you rather never be able to learn new things or never be able to unlearn old things? I would rather... Hmm, both are very tricky question. But probably not to unlearn because I prefer to learn new things. I'd rather unlearn but learn new things. Interesting, interesting. Okay. This one might be a little tricky. Would you rather be dumb but very lucky or really smart but unlucky? <laughs> very, very tricky question. <laughs> um, sometimes luck plays away, but no, I would rather be smart and unlucky. So at least I can find my own way to get my luck. 
<laughs> oh, very nice, very nice answer. Okay, now the last one for you, uh, Darshini. Would you rather have a time machine to go back in time or a teleportation device to go anywhere in the present? I would go back in time. Time machine to go back. Oh, which which era would you want to go back to? I would prefer that um, my childhood era because I see that world was very different without, not to say not without internet, but it was without so much of exposure, no social media. It's just about us living in a small space, sharing more love, caring without looking at any um, differences. So that was beautiful era that I lived. I want to go back to wow. that part. <laughs> wow, that's that's great. Uh, there are some really uh, wonderful responses you gave. Uh, Rithik, if you had if we had a hamper and you had to win it, it would, you would have like really been <laughs> already <challenged>. busted. <laughs> But let's see, let's see, uh, Ritwik, uh, we will start with you now. First question for you is, would you rather never be able to watch cricket or watch movies? Uh, rather not watch movies. I love watching cricket. So I would rather not watch movies. Uh, simple one for you, maybe. <laughs> would you rather have people hear everything you are thinking or never be able to convey what you actually mean to? Oh my God, that's a very tough one. Uh, say that again. So, Would you rather have people hear everything you are thinking right. or never be able to convey what you actually mean to? I would rather have people hear what I'm thinking because conveying and communication are absolutely critical and a must for anything and everything that you do. So I would rather have people listen in to my thoughts. <laughs> Maybe I can use that to influence them. Wow. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, next one. Uh, would you rather be the most powerful person in the world or the most respected? Uh, the most respected. And I think you'll gain some bit of power from that. I mean, power goes away at some time, right? Once it goes away and then people don't respect you. True. Right. Very nice, very nice. I think we have we are having a really tough competition here <laughs> for, the hamper, for the invisible hamper. Okay, uh, second last question for you, Ritwik. Would you rather have a life filled with adventure and travel or a life with comfort and luxury? Uh, comfort and luxury. I'm not a very adventurous guy. I would rather prop myself up on a sofa and read a book rather than go out into the mountains and hike. Okay, the last one for you, Ritwik here. Uh, would you rather never be able to travel in a car or never be able to use Google services? Never be able to use Google services. Oh, well, why is that? I mean, Google's just made us dumb, right? I mean, I remember us doing school projects and you know, doing all the research, going into the library, reading through the encyclopedias and doing all the research, reading newspapers, doing cutting up the magazines to create the pro project works. Right. And and I see my kids, you know, just Googling everything and getting the answers. And, and they're so lazy now, they have Alexa, so they don't even have to go to a Google and get the answers. They just use Alexa. So it's just getting uh, more easier and easier for them to get information. And I think the process of getting that information was itself quite enjoyable for us. Thank you so much. That, that was excellent. And, and with that, we shall now move to the more serious discussion and the topical discussion for today. And uh, to start off with, uh, I will go to Ritwik first, right? Ritwik, the traditional definition of productivity is, is very objective and mathematical and also varies from uh, sector to sector. And in certain cases, also different organizations define productivity very differently, right? In terms of input or output and those kind of things. So do you think this definition has evolved over time, especially in the post-pandemic era when you have gray areas to address? Um, absolutely, Amar. And I won't... Uh... I'm sorry to use the phrase, credit this to a uh, pandemic. But I think um, even before the pandemic set in, um, with just the advent of multi-generational workforce coming in and they having their own set of expectations and preferences of the ways of working, 
and just a, a, a deep uh, recognition among professionals about the importance and criticality of good leadership, right? Uh, and therefore giving rise to this whole space of leadership development as a market, right? And, and recognition that first time managers are important, empathy is important, empowerment is important, uh, growth is important, aspirations are important, uh, being able to connect to people are important, right? All of that, I think, made that shift about it not just being about the output, but the journey that you are taking towards that output, right? And, and what learnings do you get from that journey, recognizing those learnings and making sure that you are incorporating that in the next project or the next initiative so that you don't repeat those mistakes, right? So I think the era of the whole focusing on just the output and input was gone long, long uh, before the pandemic set in. And a lot of that credit goes to this new generation that's coming in and the importance of leadership development at the workplace. Interesting. Uh, Darshini, what's your take on this? How would you define productivity in, in the workplace? Right. I mean, I would agree with Dr. Ridwik and I think that normally what we look at productivity is the amount of work or amount of effort we are putting to produce something in a day. So let's go very basic in a day-to-day -day job um, because that's how productivity in a typical company is being measured, right? We have a KPI to be achieved from nine to five, but what actually been produced is what we have to measure. So we can give them 10 uh, KPIs in a day to be completed. So let's say we are talking about typical um, BPO company that uh, we have to close, let's say 300 to 400 tickets in a day. But are we really measuring the productivity in a way whether the quality is being met? So from my perspective, a productivity means the quality also have to be the key measurement. So if we can uh, produce something um, significant in a day, we can close 400 tickets, but nothing is um, being uh, probably, you know, the, the, out of the 400 uh, KPIs that we are delivering in a day, probably all 400 doesn't matter for the customers or the client facing, and it doesn't make um, an impact to the clients or customers to, to look at us, to come back to us, because the quality is not met. Or we can actually reach out or produce 200 in a day, and it really means a lot to our customers, our clients that keeps them coming back. So productivity, in my uh, perspective, is the quality that we are producing in, a, in our work rather than the amount of work that we are producing. For a typical company, we go by numbers, but I would say go by the quality that we are producing. How would you, for the benefit of the, our audience, list the key drivers in the uh, workplace uh, productivity? What are those drivers that actually help uh, the workforce become more productive? I think for first thing, what drives the productivity is the environment itself. The, we have to produce a conducive environment for the employee to feel safe and to feel empowered to work. That's the safe space that we call the positive work culture that we call. And what are the support they are receiving at their workplace? So for them to be producing a quality work at their workplace, uh, first of all, they must have a tool for them to produce, for them to complete their day-to-day -day tasks. If we are not providing that environment for them, the tools and the space for them, they will not be able to produce as per the expectation. So that's where the, the gap was coming up, where we, the, the management or probably the employee is, is expecting something out of the employees where we are not actually giving them the tools and the environment that they, they, they require for them to produce up to the expectation. So I would say the environment and the tools is very important for them to be able to be productive at work. That's uh, very interesting. Uh, Ritwik, would you want to add anything to what Dajin said? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Completely agree on the whole expectation, but and in fact, there's a significant amount of research done by Deloitte on this particular topic, right? And they identified three drivers towards productivity. So the first is strengths. So it's important for team leaders and team members to know what their strengths are and for team leaders to create opportunities in the day-to-day -day work of team members so that they can utilize that strength at least once a day. The second is purpose. So how do you connect what you are doing on a day-to-day -day basis to a larger purpose? 
or purpose of the organization or strategy of the organization. Right? Basically answering the question of why am I doing what am I doing, what I'm doing. And the third is going to what Darshini said about expectations, right? Having very clear, unambiguous expectations of the role and the person and being able to communicate that to the person, getting their buy-in, providing them the resources, information to be able to do that job and, uh, and, and just being very clear in that. So we now move to something very contextual and uh, relevant to current times. Uh, the entire industry is witnessing uh, large-scale layoffs. Even some of the giant tech companies are having their employees to let go, right? So do you think it is a productivity issue, Rifid? Or is it is it way beyond that? No, I, I don't think this is productivity because if you look on the flip side, some of the hiring is still continuing, right? Some of these organizations themselves are continuing with their hiring processes. Some of these organizations have re released their quarterly results and annual results recently and have done actually pretty well, right? And so this, this whole thing about the payoff, um, my view is that it's happening in areas where they hired quite a few people, but those areas didn't pick up like metaverse, for example, right? And so that's the areas where they, that's, those are the areas where they have laid off people, but they've continued their hiring processes in other areas. So this is more of a business decision uh, than a productivity decision. All right. Okay. Abhashini, and you would like to uh, add anything? Right. So I, I would agree with Dr. Ritwik saying that it's not solely productivity issue because I do disagree if you say, um, if you want to claim that productivity is one of the main uh, reason why layoffs are ha happening, it can be one of the reason. In most cases in past three, let's say, let's take this past three years, layoffs are happening. That's because the company changes their strategy. When their business strategy changes according to the situation, the financial situation, economic situation, they may face certain uh, redundancy. So the redundancy causes the layoffs rather than the productivity, because as Dr. Ritwik mentioned, they are still hiring, but in a different sector. So they may close a department that does all the work manually when in past three years, we have to work hybrid and we have to work online. So they may have to increase workforce in a way where the, the new department will be supporting the business because the whole department may not be able to support anymore. So the change of process, the change in demand coming from the suppliers, coming from the clients, that's where it gives more impact to the layoffs rather than the productivity. Productivity plays a very small number. When it comes to laying off a certain number of people, probably that's where productivity is coming into the picture. But overall, I would say it's the change of the business nature and how the, in, the organization is actually facing in the, the challenges currently that's happening globally. So the next question would be, what is the role of organization culture in workforce productivity and how can leaders encourage more employee engagement and motivation to boost this productivity? Uh, Ritwik, if you can take, take this one first. Sure. So I think culture is a strong foundation to build a productivity environment. And I would go back to what I mentioned earlier in terms of being able to help people identify their strengths, give opportunities to practice the strengths connect what they're doing to a larger purpose and then um, having very clear expectations out of that. But the, the foundation of all of this, I think are, are a few elements like trust, right? Having absolute trust in employees, being able to provide them uh, psychological safety so that they are able to bring their authentic self to the workplace and be able to be who they are without worrying about any repercussions, right? So we, we all have our own ways of working and a person is highest on their productivity if they are able to do what they are doing in their own natural way of doing it, right? And so if they want to speak up, if they want to push back, if they want to be assertive, if we have, if we provide them with that space that they are able to practice uh, being themselves uh, and doing what they love to do, uh, I think that's one way in uh, which we can enhance engagement and productivity. Perfect. Okay. Adarshini, what's your take on that? Right. Um Absolutely. I think Dr. Ritwik is also think, I mean, we, we think a line. So I could see that um, how we are looking at how organization culture mm -hmm. plays an impact into productivity. So I would say if we, we look back three years before, work-life balance is something that we always earn for, yearn for. So we always talk about hybrid working. We want to request for the companies to give us work from home facilities. This is something we always ask for. 
And without asking, the nature actually give us that opportunity to work from home, work-life balance and everything. But what happens after two years, the same employees actually coming back to say that I'm exhausted, I'm getting burnout, I couldn't focus. Because when we are giving the work-life balance without, uh, without a meaning to it, because uh, what we are doing is we talk about work-life balance, but we overtake life, uh, we overtake uh, work into our life where when we were working hybridly in the past three years, we may be spending more hours working instead of working in the office. So that's where we realized that if we want to talk about a culture where it's about work-life balance, it's actually the culture where the company is um, cultivating the productivity in a positive way. So that means if we have to work nine to five, let's say in the six hour, uh, eight hours job. So now it's like seven to eight hours job. What, how much can we bring value to our productivity within the seven to eight hours? And then we have to actually put a uh, barrier. We have to put a break that we have to take some time off for our balanced life. But in the current environment where we actually dwell into the work-life balance, we talk about hybrid working and we work more, it gives a very negative perception that it, we don't have a work-life balance anymore. So that brings me to uh, a realization re recently that it's actually not work-life balance or it's not actually hybrid working that we are looking for. We're actually looking for more positive environment where we are being empowered by providing us a culture where they recognize our work, they recognize our um, how much of effort we are putting and giving more motivation for us to drive through our work on a daily basis. So this I call appreciative teams culture. That's something have been missing in past probably a couple of years when we are all working from home, we mind our own work and we just meet our colleagues on Teams or web or you know online meetings. But how much we are appreciating each other and supporting each other to ensure everybody is actually balanced, everybody is having a good productivity at workplace. So for me, the, the culture that, that an organization should be um, encouraged uh, in every workplace would be bring a culture where the teams are appreciating each other, supporting each other. Then that's where a workplace culture, a more positive workplace culture can be um, introduced and everybody will feel supported. So that's that's automatically will support in productivity. We will now move from the culture aspect to the process aspect and the question would be uh, how significant is process enhancement for productivity growth and how can organizations involve employees in the process mm -hmm. of uh, this process improvement? Ritwik, would you like to take this one first? Yeah, sure. So um, I think um, process improvement is just one of the inputs and it's absolutely critical to take your last mile employee into consideration as you are thinking about productivity and process improvements, right? They are front and center dealing with either customers or the machinery or the tools or the information. And uh, a lot of times, I mean, there are a lot of case studies where people sitting in ivory tower have decided what a process should look like and pushed it down the hierarchy. And eventually the person at the end of the line, when they're using that process, it actually doesn't work and breaks things down, right? So I think it's absolutely critical for us to take the last uh, mile employee into consideration, get their inputs uh, and use that information in co-creating process improvements because they are the people who are going to use it. That builds ownership and accountability as well on those, uh, on those changes. A great example of this is Southwest, right? The reason Southwest was able to be what they are and be able to compete in such a tough market and be able to uh, become profitable in a very short period of time was because they had their gate agents empowered as well to take decisions on the spot. In addition to all the other things that they were doing, uh, their gate agents were, were, were empowered to take decisions on discounts, on rechecking, on baggage, and all of the things where other airlines used to take that decision up the hierarchy and it would impact customer uh, delight. So I think uh, it's important for us to take that into consideration and all of this will lead to, in some sense, uh, customer delight, customer retention, and, and customer satisfaction. Lovely example there, Ritwik. Thank you so much. Dashni, uh, would, would you want to add something to what Ritwik 
Right. So um, a process is very significant when it's actually being owned by the employees who are actually working on the process itself rather than the decision makers who are sitting on the bench and just saying this should be done in a certain way. So I say I would I would say that um, the employees who are working on the ground have to take ownership given the opportunity to be involved in the decision making or even at least in a, in a group where they are making some feedbacks, giving some surveys, uh, doing some surveys and giving feedbacks because these are the feedbacks coming from the ground on how they can enhance the process, how they can improve the productivity because they are the one producing it at the end of the day. Sometimes from the management level, we won't see what are the gaps is happening at the working level. It's very important the survey feedback is conducted and it's very important to involve the working level uh, employees to be involved as a part of the process ownership. So they know that this is something involves them and it's it's for them to, to increase their productivity and automatically the entire process will flow because they are involved in the entire process and they feel they are being appreciated. They feel that they are every, every words coming from them or every feedback matters the most to the organization as well. So for me, it's, it's a team itself. The, the employee should be given the ownership to be a part of the process making. So how do you think leaders can ensure that processes are standardized across uh, departments and locations, especially in context of the entire hybrid work? Right. So if I take my case as an example, we have like 34 offices. And when it comes to LND, learning and development programs, we have to align. We have to first do training analysis. We have to understand what each regions are facing difficulties. And then we have to identify and address each every concern. It's very difficult, I would say, for us to actually manage a, a global working skill in from a hybrid uh, working environment. Even if I go to the office, I still feel like it's a hybrid because I still meet uh, my other peers, other colleagues from our team's meetings only. I don't see them physically. Whoever I meet in physically, I don't work uh, directly or closely with. They are just um, colleagues from coming from the entity. So how we can ensure is the communication. So it's very important whether uh, whatever that I wanted to communicate to other team members or other peers or other leaders, it has to be clearly structured and it has to be um, understood as well in a different region in a different cultural perspective if i wanted to come up with the uh, instructions let's say a uh, new instructions and if we have a region that we know there will be difficulty in giving uh, them a long in, uh, instructions in english localization comes in place i think this is something that quite a number of companies are leaning towards nowadays which i'm re i really appreciate because when they are conducting trainings or when they are delivering something we could see that the materials are being prepared in different local languages because they want to support their employees in a different region from coming from different culture to be able to understand what we would like to implement in the company or we want to bring the changes to the organization. So the localization plays a role where our, our employees are all aligned under, to understand how the company is leading to it. And having a clear workflow. So first thing, whatever that we're going to start with, a clear workflow is very important. I think a basic RACI model is what will work, where we must identify who's responsible, who's accountable, who's going to be informed. So when we have a model that every team from the ground up to the top is going to be following, we will, I, I would say the closing the gap will be much more easier. We will not go wrong in any way because we can already identify who's responsible and we know the deliverable coming from particular department or particular team, rather than we do not know who's going to be taking responsible, but we're coming up with the workflow saying that team A should deliver it. But in team A, we should have who is going to be delivering it so that we are very clear of the entire process. So organization, especially in hybrid workplace, I would say having a clear communication and also making sure everyone in the organization understands what we want to implement. So that means a bit of the cultural value coming in, localization or letting them know in their own language and et cetera, giving them an additional, um, it, it's we appreciating them and their culture additionally, making sure the workflow is properly uh, segregated to ensure who's responsible and then from there, we can start working on the change making process. So that's my take on this. That's an excellent point of view, Dashini, stemming from your own uh, experience and role, right? 
specific your take on that yeah so this is one of the uh, uh, most important questions right and and this is one of the critical reasons why uh, why we fail at process improvements or productivity enhancements right because as organizations grow um, different regions start to grow um, you have different hiring patterns and as people start to come into the organization they start to bring in their own culture their own flavor and their own ways of doing things right and so so you've got then microcosms of organizations across one large organization right um but on the other end of the spectrum if you try and force a standardized process across several geographies without consideration for localization or local context that would also lead to some resistance from the system and people and therefore uh, challenges or issues right so it's a balancing act that needs to happen and i think this is where uh, what darshini was saying makes sense is you know open communication honest communication frequent communication right with all the key stakeholders with all the collaborators with uh, the frontline people the people who are using the processes is going to be important and critical and then taking a decision uh, with the with the intent of uh, with with the organizational view right not a not a local view or not a title view or not a role view but taking a decision based is the organize what's best for the organization uh is is important and this is where your governance mechanisms your reporting mechanisms uh all of this uh falls into place right i think i could also add a little bit on that um i would also see that the buy in process is very important because when we are implementing or we would like to start something initiate something from the organizational level usually it starts from the management level and we want to implement something just immediately without concerning about how they take from the other side from other culture or other region but the what the best method i could propose is to do a buy in we yeah. go to all the regions all the offices and making sure everybody understands what are we going to change and once everybody agreed with the buy in process then we implement it you will see the result will be significant because everybody agrees and we have already incorporated all the feedback so the buy in process is a very significant role in this that leads me to my next question and a lot of organizations may be interested in this as to how they can actually measure whether a certain process enhancement has led to the improvement in overall productivity of the organization i quickly like to take that uh, so you know um, the old adage goes right what uh, gets measured and reported gets done right so it's important uh and and critical for us to i i think the one word that that would help organizations here is systems thinking right so uh take a take a step back take a more holistic comprehensive view of this try and understand what are you trying to change why are you trying to change it how much do you want to change it so that's your step one the second step is then how will you know that you are successful right what indicators lead lag indicators would help you understand that you are on the right track and uh, you could make course corrections basis that then the third bucket of uh, questions to be answered is you know what kind of capabilities are needed for you to be able to support those changes right uh, what kind of skill sets are needed what kind of mindsets are needed so i think these uh, three or four buckets of questions need to be front and center as you are trying to think through this uh, identifying them and of course going back to what dashni was saying buy in buy in buy in you know always you know keep your frontline people informed keep your frontline people uh, communicated to and 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 getting their inputs into this so what you know uh, basis the work that they are doing what kind of metrics will get influenced bring that into the picture and then start uh, your backward integration dashni would you like to add something I mean um from my experience because we are coming from more on L&D process side you know usually how we measure is to look at how successfully the project has been implemented how successfully everybody has accepted or uh, the some a new process that has been implemented so let's say we are talking about implementing a new software or a new project a new technology to the company it takes a, a year probably for us to implement it but how successfully we can measure it is to look at how fast or how easily every um, other entities or the employees are actually onboarding to the business onboarding to the process 
So that some, sometimes it takes a long time and sometimes we may see some negative impact as well. We may see some um, setbacks. People stop following the process because it, it doesn't matter to them anymore. It doesn't work for them anymore. It may work in certain regions. So each time when we see a setback or when we are seeing a, a negative outcome or output coming from the process that we are implementing, the best way to measure is to just put a pause over there, come back to the ground and rediscuss and see what is different that we have to do for us to you know, start back the implementation process. So that way we are measuring it not at the end of the process where it may be good, it may be bad, but we are measuring it at every stage of the implementation. We Every, every time we want to implement something, we will have a phase, uh, we will have a pilot phase, and then we will have a regional or batch by batch as well. Most companies, I believe, follow the pilot phase. So pilot phase is our, 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 our phase where we can actually measure at least the initial uh, impact of the overall in, uh, implementation of the process. So I would say the measurement of the entire implementation, it should be done in a phase by phase phases. So that at the end of the project, uh, along the way, we are making changes according to the feedback, according to the impact we are facing, and then we conclude it in a positive way. Yeah. I think if I can just add to that, the importance of pilots and stress testing has been lost, right? I think it's very important to go small in a, uh, a, you know, for, a, for a large change and then see what kind of impact it is having, what kind of changes are needed to support it, and then move into a broader area. But I also want to mention the importance of data here. Right? I think uh, using the language of data is absolutely critical. And a lot of times, we don't do that because of variety of reasons, right? Um, you know, just from a fear of accuracy, from a fear of uh, being vulnerable also, we try and mask all of that in the language of English rather than using the language of data, right? I think it's absolutely critical to ensure that we are using data. Um, we are creating smart goals. So there's very clear objective set, very clear understanding of what is being measured. How will it be measured? When will it be measured? How is it being reported? and then keep the rigor on it in terms of reporting it and, and uh, tracking it. Right. Totally agree with that. Yeah. Uh, with that, we come to the last question. And for that, I would, again, I like to touch upon something that is more uh, recent and relevant uh, to today's times. And with the entire example of chat GPT and other AI tools in perspective, uh, but do you think that tech enablers like these will enhance the overall productivity gain or will it lead to more demotivation i mean i mean fear of job losses and all of those things this way i would actually love to put all these questions on chat gpt and see what the response is <laughs> <laughs> and maybe do a comparison of you know how how darshani and i are doing on this but um, i think uh, you know i i don't think you know, technology has always evolved, right? It's not going to stop evolving, right? We are at the place where we are today because of all the, uh, you know, changes and enhancements that we have seen over the last several years. I don't think so. This leads to job loss. I think it just leads to a change in the way jobs are done and therefore reskilling and upskilling become that much more critical. So the new job is how do you use chat GPT? Right? That's the new skill. Uh, how do you train it? How do you utilize it for various purposes? And I'm already seeing a lot of these, um, you know, tutorials come up on online about how to use it, how to use chat GPT. So that's the new skill. Right? So technology will continue to evolve. I think we've got to understand the trends. We have to know what our adjacent areas are. How does technology influence those? And then keep ourselves up to date by uh, upskilling and reskilling. Awesome. Dasini, your take on AI? Sure. So I think um, regarding chat GPT, I was a little bit backtracked because I was quite busy with all this happening in my organization for the past two months. And suddenly when I come across chat GPT, I started wondering, what is this? Everybody's talking about chat GPT. And I just went through the portal and see, I was amazed to know that, you know, it actually replacing a human's brain, how an idea can be interpreted and can be, it, it can give you entire idea how you can write something or publish something. It's, it's awesome that, AI is being invented that way. But I also, as you, as you asked, I, 
it does give a little fear whether it's going to take over human but in a long run it may maybe in the next 10 years and maybe in a 5 to 10 years but in the next 5 years or to 10 years we still have we still need human to actually improve the ai like in our organization we do use ai in localization because translation is something very complex um, we have machine translations we have google translations but if you put a word something in english or a different language and ask the google to translate it the english translation is is brainless i think you cannot accept how google is translating certain words so it actually gives us uh, assurance that human cannot be replaced because when we are bringing in ai it's very machine and if we want to bring ai to a job that is very structured it does a it does b and the output is c so it's very structured then yes machine can take over it it may impact the, uh, the productivity of, of human itself but if it requires human brain thinking capability and cultural sense and all that i don't think ai will can replace us at least for the next 10 to 15 years unless they can really invent an ai that can think as how human can think a very best example is in language itself when we are translating something we do not do machine translation or direct translation we have to translate the language according to how uh, let's say take a movie we have to understand first the movie we have to understand which audience are uh, watching it in different language and we have to translate it to the expect that language is interpreted properly a wrong translation can give you a wrong meaning as well because language is broad so i would say rather than demotivated i think our our youngsters or our our nowadays our generation should look into ai as a as a tool to support their work but it can never replace the human touch and human brain of it so they should not be demotivated but they should be feeling supported with ai to give them a little support to boost them when they are lack of idea when they need something to kick start with but at the end of the day it's their work it's is the human that is going to produce it so that's how i could see differently when we talk about ai because this is a recent conversation we had with our team where the ai is going to take away our business but we are very sure that it's not going to do that at least for the next 10 to 15 years yeah and uh, i think if i can just add to it right this um, this research that says there's still a set of capabilities which are being termed as essential human capabilities that are still required even with all the automation and technology uh, revolution right so you still uh, need humans for social intelligence emotional intelligence empathy decision making critical thinking creativity right and, and like darshini was saying language is uh, heavy on context right so ai can get the words but can't get the context in right at least for now right so uh, i think the relevance for humans will continue to be there so because you both are meeting each other or seeing each other for the first time we want to know how much you've understood each other right and and for that we will play this a uh, two lies and a truth game and we will go to ritwik first so ritwik which of the following statements about darshini is true there are three statements only one is true you will have to tell which is true okay she has a passion for horse riding second she has a degree in films and broadcasting third she founded an ngo for animals rights in 2050 which statement about darshini is true the last one setting up the ngo darshini would you like to shed some light on that <laughs> ngo is correct but not on animals but i'm from the film and broadcasting background okay. interesting but NGO is right. so the correct uh, answer so the correct answer is she has a degree in films and broadcasting she did found an ngo uh, but it was on human rights more than animal rights interesting very interesting yeah i really boast of uh, the fact that nobody ever uh, gets these statements right <laughs> <laughs> my turn i'm dubbed up already my heart beat is increasing <laughs> okay so darshini which of these statements about ritwik is true before joining nolscape Ritwik led leadership development for PwC US. Second, he holds a degree in civil engineering. Third, he has a passion for cooking. I think it's one. 
Before joining Northcap, Ritwik led leadership development for PwC US. Ritwik, would you shed some light on that? You know, Darshani, it's their fault. They're trying to trick us. <laughs> so this is Deloitte US, not PwC US. But the third answer is right. I do love cooking. Ah, right. In my free time, yeah. Oh, they're just changing the what word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, otherwise it will become really easy and, and we expect all our guests to do some homework around the other guests, right? <laughs> so this is this is a message for all of our future guests. Future study, guests. Study your uh, co-panelists before the show. Exactly. Nice. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, Itrik and Dashini, for those lovely insights. And, and I had a wonderful... Uh, uh, time talking to both of you and getting your perspectives yeah. and takeaways on, on a very uh, important and relevant subject of workplace of productivity. Thank you so much uh, for being on the knowledge show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emma. Thank you so much, Darshan. It was a pleasure meeting you. Pleasure meeting you, Mr. Ritwik and Amar as well. Thank you for this platform so we will be able to share and learn from Dr. Ritwik. Same here. Likewise. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Bye.